Is that dim enough? That looks dim enough. Good morning, everybody. Uh, really quick show of hands. How many people here are programmers? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, so, welcome to a talk about City of Brass and the uh, procedural nature of that game. My name is Edward Orman, and I'm a designer. I'm Andrew James. I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> this empty spot here is Ryan Lancaster, the third founder of Upper, Uppercut Games, and he's the programmer who should be here giving this deeply technical talk about the procedural nature of the game. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm kind of high level sort of stuff and then there's a sort of low level deep technical stuff and we're going to meet somewhere in the middle there so there, right. there, we are going to try and delve as deeply as we can but you'll have to forgive us if our scratching sort of explanations of things are uh, maybe not as detailed as you would like. And if you have really deep questions, I did threaten Ryan with actually calling him and putting him on speakerphone at the end. Um, but if that doesn't work, then you know, we'll have the email addresses are up um, and you can always ask us questions afterwards. So um, that is our introduction. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of City of Brass. Uh, it's a first person Arabian Nights roguelite game. Um, and it's currently in early access on Steam and we'll be bringing it to consoles uh, early next year. So who are we? Uh, we started Uppercut Games in 2011, a bunch of ex Irrational and um, 2K devs. We first went to mobile, did uh, Epoch, Epoch 2, a couple of other little games. Uh, and then we did Submerge, which was for PC on Steam and, uh, on, and consoles. Uh, another little mobile game last, late last year, and then uh, now we're working on City of Brass. So we've got six full-time developers, three programmers, two artists, and one designer. Basically the three founders. So I guess the point of that is we are... Um, we do our best, uh, and we do our best to learn how to operate as a small business with a small number of resources. Um, so what this talk is about, as we've already established, we're not programmers. Uh, this talk is a little technical um, and we will do our best. Um, we want to present to you what we wanted to do with City of Brass, how we got to that position in, in deciding what it was that we wanted to do with that game, um, how we would evaluate how we were going to achieve what we wanted to do, and then um, talk about some of the implementation that we've done so far uh, from what we've learned uh, we're obviously still implementing because because we're in early access. We're still adding features and things like that. I'll take it. Okay. So uh, submerged uh, was a game released two years ago on PC, Xbox, and PS4, um, and you know it did pretty well. But it was super labor intensive for us. Uh, the world that we created was kilometers on a side, and it was all handcrafted. Uh, so. That meant that it took us a long time to build and it made it super inflexible. Once we started getting feedback from people, there wasn't a lot we could do because we'd gone so far through um, in building these giant structures. I don't know if anybody knows the game, but it's about climbing buildings largely and boating around in this sunken city. Um, but those buildings were all handcrafted and we just couldn't, couldn't make a lot of changes and it, uh, it just took us a long time to actually to build that. And, and just to do bug fixing and testing uh, it was really laborious. So we spoke a lot about what we wanted to do as a, as a company and as a business. And we wanted to sort of shift from this paradigm we, were, we felt like we were stuck in, which was the gameplay time that we could create for anything. Because we were manually creating, even our mobile games, we manually created each level and it was all handcrafted. Uh, so our, our gameplay time in any product was sort of really uh, directly related to how much production time we had or development time and how many people we had on the team and we knew we couldn't grow the team and we couldn't spend more money so we decided to try to shift to a I guess a new process where the gameplay time we could create in a product was not directly related we sort of had some sort of multiplier and we looked at that with some some sort of systemic variation or procedural nature um, for the next project so that that took us to the goals that we had for City of Brass um, we wanted to make a, a space that was procedurally generated um, to, to undercut that problem. Um, we wanted to make a procedural space that was believable and uh, we'll get to what, what, what we mean by that and obviously we also want to make a place that's playable, that, that um, is able to spawn and support its own gameplay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the procedural, I guess the, uh, the requirements was we wanted to create a, 
a space that um, could be could be generated at runtime uh, from a single seed. So we could do QA, we could get a seed off somebody, bring it back, re regenerate the level. Uh, this is all things, obviously, a lot of people, have, other people have done in different ways before, but we would had no experience with this. Um, we wanted to generate the levels at runtime, so we weren't shipping any level content other than the pieces and the code. And we wanted it to perform well, so um, one, of the, one of the things we spent a lot of time in with Submerge was we created this giant city, and then optimization was just a nightmare uh, because it was all handcrafted. Optimizing all those handcrafted things took a lot of time and just sucked, sucked a lot of time out of the production where we probably, maybe could have been adding more features or more gameplay or the feedback we were getting from testers. Uh, so that was what we wanted out of the procedural uh, system. We, we did talk a little bit. Uh, other people have used procedural for different solutions, I guess, and one of them is you can maybe generate a bunch of levels and then save those and keep them stored offline and then choose randomly from those. But we, we just figured having the whole thing run at runtime was, was better for us because every time we add a new feature, which is what we're still doing, you, know, you don't want to have to regenerate those levels, so it's better just do it at runtime. Um, so when we say believable, we're not trying to make a realistic place, not, not with this game anyway, um, it's part of the advantage of the fantasy setting is that we can make a, uh, make a place that doesn't exist anywhere but it feels like it might exist. Um, it has to feel like this ancient city, uh, maybe the sort of stuff that you've seen in Indiana Jones or, or any of those sort of fantasy things. But it still has to be believable. We wanted it to have a sense of place. We wanted, it, we wanted the player to be able to look at these uh, streets and rooms and things and, and understand what they were. Mostly so they could intuit, you know, like this is where I'm going to go next or this is what this place used to be for. Um, and then it had to be dressed procedurally, obviously. Um, it's, it's one thing to just create the whole space, but then you want to make it be dressed with the props in a way that makes sense. You can't just spawn things in the middle of nowhere, which uh, we did do, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Oh, just back on the believable thing, I think we also had... Um, settle down. Yeah. We also uh, we have different challenges because we're first person. Uh, in 2D or even isometric, uh, obviously your view as a player is limited. So in first person, we had a much more difficult task of like when you place somebody in a world, for them to believe that that's a real, real space. It, I mean, we all know what the real world three-dimensional spaces look like. So we had to try and make sure that, that that still rang true in a way that you can't do in 2D. Oh, and so with playable, um, We've got a lot of background in, in like hand scripted level design, uh, obviously from Bioshock and games like that, and even Epoch. That was all handcrafted uh, work. Uh, but we know a lot of the, the classic sort of level design rules. We wanted to try and codify those so that the algorithms that we create or use were generating things like uh, you know, navigable spaces, player, uh, loop spaces so the player has interest, um, you know, visual blockages so the player has uh, interest as they go around one side or the other. Um, Cues in the distance to head towards. Yeah, drawing the player through, yep. off interesting side paths and dead ends and, and rewarding for the player for exploration there. So this takes us to our first step, step which was uh, evaluation and prototyping. So we knew we had these, sort of, these goals set, uh, so how do we go about making a totally new game? Uh, the first step I, I, I did was uh, researching a bunch of other games. So Ed, Ed started playing some other procedural games. We looked at uh, Ziggurat and Heavy Bullets, which were two first-person procedural games uh, that were just on Steam. Uh, and then we also looked at what other, what tech is out there that we might be able to use. Uh, we're already, we've been using Unreal 4, being like, basically if we can't, we're not a tech house, so we wanted to see if there was anything we could actually, you know, use to kickstart our prototyping. That's actually a super important point, it's in Unreal 4. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we actually mentioned that yet. So there's a plugin I found, like I think the first day I was looking, it's called Dungeon Architect. Uh, Course, it cost 99 bucks. I bought a license of it, plugged it in, downloaded it, and um, and and started looking at it. Uh, it's obviously a lot of this talk is about where this plugin was a year ago. So uh, some of the things uh, they've actually developed in parallel with what we're doing. So uh, I think let's just take take note that when we evaluated this, it was in a different place to where it was. Um, so it has two basically major uh, elements to it. It can Generate a procedural layout, which is basically grabbing a bunch of, at a very high level, grabbing a bunch of boxes and pushing them around in a 2D space, then joining them together with paths, and then uh, has a second, second, uh, second element, which is it then themes that space, like puts walls and floors in, 
based on a bunch of based on a bunch of UI elements that you specify. Here's what a wall looks like. Here's what a floor looks like. Here's what a door looks like. So for our for, for our game, we have a setting called the streets. We have the catacombs. We have the palace, um, and we have the gardens. And each one of those is considered a theme as far as dungeon architect is concerned. So when with our initial initial evaluation, the problems we found with the layout generator was it was totally random. So it just created boxes, pushed them out, joined them together, created a cool procedural space you could walk through, but there was no flow, there was no control of where the where you started, where you ended. Uh, different seeds, so you could, there's a bunch of settings there, it was great. You could try different shapes and sizes, but at different seeds would generate vastly different outcomes. Uh, and it was just basically impossible to say, like, here's the first level of the game and it's going to be this big and the player's going to spend this much time in this space. And uh, the height variation created, because we decided to use it in a different way than it was designed, the height variation created basically like staircases that went into walls and dead ends and multiple stairs going through each other, as you'll see in uh, probably the next video. So this is just a quick video of uh, basically the vanilla plugin that we bought and got a, 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 a similar, a same set of settings, but we're just basically randomizing the seed and it's generating a whole bunch of different things. The, the uh, green cells are corridors and the red ones are rooms. There's really no control over how many rooms you're getting, how many corridors you're getting, what the, the distance between them is and the, the size of the, the playable space. And it's, it's awesomely flexible, but you can tell, like, if every one of these is completely different to the other one, so there's no reliability in the system at this stage. And a super quick video just of, so here's what this looked like from, as, from our starting point. Um, I think it's, it's important to note that this was still a great leg up for us. Like, here's a, here's a thing that generates a bunch of spaces with meshes in it that we can drop in and run through. Uh, so as a starting point, uh, it was actually really good. And we're already starting to make decisions uh, in this area too, just with how high are our walls going to be if we're going to try and convince people you're in an ancient Arabian city and how large are our tiles going to be. So the second part was the theming uh, system which basically spawned all the walls and tiles. Uh, a few problems we initially identified was the uh, single walls single size of every, each cell had to be the same. So if you decided to make your space four metres by four metres, that's a tile. Everything had to be four metres wide. Um, and you could only use, you could only, you could only make things out of four metre tiles. Uh, so to create any sort of visual navigation or cues or anything, anything uh, bigger than that, it just wasn't possible. And um, the individual tiles had no knowledge of what was adjacent to them, what was across from them. They were basically just spawned into the world with, with a mesh. Or, or, a, or a blueprint or an asset. And again, super, just to add some context to what we're talking about, it's just a super quick, here's a, here's a level that was generated. Um, these floor tiles and wall tiles are just all, all the same size and uh, there was not a lot of variation we could add at a, at a sort of a larger, a larger scale. I think you get the point. Yeah. So having evaluated Dungeon Architect, the, these were the results we came away from um, with it. So uh, we could do iterative testing straight away. That was great. That was uh, an important uh, leg up for us. Um, even though it didn't do exactly what we wanted, it was such a leap forward from starting from scratch. And like AJ said, we're not a tech house, so starting from scratch was not really on the, on the charts for us. Um, but it was such a huge leg up that we, we decided we would just go for it and, and use this plugin. And honestly, the theming UI, uh, which there was a snippet picture of before, um, was actually pretty good. It's quite clever. Um, it works pretty well. And so, again, that was going to be another shortcut that was going to serve us well. So, having decided to use this plugin, um, time to do lots of more, lots more experimentation and tests to actually achieve what we wanted to make in the game. So the next step was doing some environment prototyping, uh, which involved taking one of these procedural spaces, pressing the button, then turning the rest of the system off, and just going through and putting art in how I thought, well, this is what I want, this is what I want the game to finally look like. Um, well, so this was not a procedural task, this was, yeah. we just saved off one of the maps that it generated, and then AJ spent a week, I guess, actually just building 
building it out and trying to, this is a time to experiment with what the art was going to look like as well, but building it out to see how we would actually achieve what we wanted. So this was a way of basically coming up with the requirements for what the procedural system we wanted for our game to do. Uh, one of the first things I realised was I didn't want everything to look the same, so I wanted like the illusion of, of buildings, which meant probably need, needed a bunch of these tiles, adjacent tiles, to look the same, and then another bunch of adjacent tiles to look different, but the same <laughs> as each other, to create the illusion of buildings. Um, and also just having, having, uh, having tiles or pieces of mesh that extrude out into the space and take up floor space uh, and spans going across the space. Uh, all of these things we weren't immediately, immediately able to do, but this quick uh, just prototyping of um, how I wanted it to look uh, basically set us some goals, helped, helped us set the goals for the project. Uh, and also just sort of gave me a better idea of like what we couldn't, like there was, there was going to be constraints on this thing and this, this basically set a bunch of those constraints of what we probably could and couldn't achieve. But so here we are walking through this space too and at the same time, um, you know, we're establishing some important rules for the player and, and the physics um, and various attributes, the move, movement speed based on the size of the corridors we were going to be making, jump heights, jump distances, all of those things were, were sort of proceeding at the same time. And again, because we'd just chosen to use this thing, it, it, it unasked a whole bunch of questions. We now just had to grapple with how to do what we wanted in here rather than starting from scratch. It's still using single small tiles in case that wasn't obvious to you. It's still four yeah. by four tiles. So the, uh, the results of this environment, environmental prototyping uh, was we had to talk about trying to create these buildings and we thought, well, really, um, we need to just replace the single, the single tiles with larger elements that can then be created to, to look like a facade or a building or something bigger. So we could have sort of a, a, a larger scale Feet, like visual features. Uh, the other thing we looked we looked at was like doorways are important, and if you've just got this set scale to make them, especially in a first-person game, you need to, you know, there's a classic, there's the red light over there, and I need to go, or there's the big, the big uh, piece of architecture, and that's where I need to head for sort of visual cues. So we wanted to make doorways bigger, more important. Um, we need landmarks for navigation, so you went into a space, you can recognise uh, the difference between. The, the, you know, the wall, the wall layout might be three boxes put together, but if you're coming in here and there's a unique mesh or a large object, you can sort of, the player can then navigate through the space. Spans across the streets and prop placement that was based on some sort of rules as opposed to just random, random spawning sort of anywhere on the floor. Just to clarify, spans across the streets is things like archways. Um, we, we talk a little bit later about it, but I realise not everyone knows what we mean when we say spans. It's just archways across yeah. corridors that link the two sides. Um, so, now we jammed our procedural space and our art test together and we came up with this. Um, this is our first attempt at having some actual gameplay, having object placement um, and having a generated space. And it's pretty crap. It, it totally works, right? Like you've got doorways and things like that. You've got height variation. We're starting to see how this system's going to work. There's literally no navigable space here. Like, I, as a level designer, this space drove me insane. Um, none of it makes sense. Even watching this video yesterday, I didn't realise until just before that we actually did a big... He ran around in a loop because there's no navigation marks. Um, you can see objects are spawned in the middle of tiles. There's absolutely no logical placement. The traps, that were, the, the, just a handful of traps that are even in this level, are not in any logical place. So the, there's no intuitiveness for a player. There's no flow. Um, and we need to really, really work hard on that. So the next stage is how do we implement these, these uh, grand plans we have? Um, so how do we achieve the results of putting spans in, putting long walls, logical placement of assets? Um, so what sort of system do we need to make to add these elements that we want? So here's where we will attempt to get slightly technical. Feel free to laugh at any moment where I sound like an idiot. Um, so the solution that Ryan came up with and, and the biggest weakness that we found within Dungeon Architect was that none of the tiles know anything about each other. There's no knowledge within the system really about um, what's going on around it. So when it spawns a tile, it kind of does it in isolation. So uh, Ryan realised pretty quickly that we needed to build up a data set of each tile. It needs to know what's to the left, what's to the right, what it's adjacent to um, with the walls. Um, 
And so uh, basically he built a system which would walk around the perimeter. We'll go into this in a bit more detail in a second. It just walked around the perimeter of an area and how we chose an area I'll talk about too um, and built up that array. Um, it let us detect a whole bunch of really important information which we would then use for not just spawning art but also gameplay. Um, and then it would also look at the floor tiles and, and that was related to most importantly where traps go um, in a game which is filled with traps. Uh, that's, that's really important to know. So if we go to, go to the next one, um, some really quick terminology. Uh, Dungeon Architect has the tiles, which is the four by fours we've been talking about. Then it has the cells. In this diagram, there's, there's basically there's two rooms, which are blue, but there's three cells there, which are making up the corridor. So it spawns these three cells, smushes them together and says, well, that's, well, it doesn't say that's one space. It just says, here's a bunch of cells. So that's kind of what we did. We, um, we said, okay, these cells need to be defined in some way together. So walking the perimeter. I mean, this is pretty low, pretty simple stuff, right? But all this is doing is it's going around and identifying the wall tiles, not the floor tiles at this stage. And it's not spawning anything yet. It's just saying, okay, this is where wall, wall pieces are going to be. Um, and it's going to be, able, we're going to be able to package those things together. And it just goes around and it turns that corridor into one contiguous space. Um, so part of that process is detecting corners. Um, again, not exactly rocket science, but uh, if you go back one, you'll see even just when walking this perimeter and with the tile-based system that we have, we need to know where those outer corners are because there's gaps. Um, so we've got to be able to place specific objects there. Um, so now we've got that data set. And again, we still haven't spawned anything yet. It's just now taking the opportunity to go back through and say, okay, where can we batch things together? How can we take two or three walls, wall pieces and put them together? Um, and that allowed us to make some decisions about just creating longer wall assets. Yeah, I think one of the other things I didn't mention was this performance on a first-person game where you're looking obviously out into the space and having every 4x4 four four metre area spawning a single mesh. The object count always starts to blow out and it can actually quite restrict the, the size of the space you're making. So uh, just reducing the object, number of objects was actually another high priority for this system to sort of go hand-in-hand hand with being able to make, make larger, larger unique-looking pieces. So we've got now we've got longer walls, yep. and we need to detect. We want these bigger doors that can be like a set piece. Where do I need to go? Uh, where did I come from? What does it look like? So, we'll, so we then they, we go through and detect which doors have a space next to them. So then we can remove those tiles and just put a single bigger door frame in. Which doors have? If there's a set of stairs next to a door or something, some other feature of generated by the the height variation, then we'd have to leave the door uh, as a single one. We realised later on this, oh boy, I'm louder now, that this diagram is a bit misleading because I screwed up and put the same case for both doors. They actually would have both returned the same case, which is it's okay to spawn a three-wall thing here. So just pretend that the one on the right is a single door, single wall door and the one on the left is a three-door span. So the, the, the next thing we look at is uh, walking out off each corner, external corner, and then seeing if we hit a wall so we can put a span in uh, being either a clothesline, an archway, some other architectural feature. Um, you can see how some of this stuff works later, but it breaks up the boxiness of the space having a more organic shape, be an arch or, or a, a rock, a rock formation. Uh, so this, we could we could walk out and uh, find up to four or five, um, four or five uh, tiles across. And if it, we hit another wall, then that's another potential space. All of these are potentials. Like all of these are. Potentially, here's a place where we can put an archway. Here's a, here's a corner. Here's a doorway, and it's all just going into the um, into the database. Um, so now this is another walk around the perimeter, but it's for floor tiles instead of the wall tiles. Um, it lets us detect the edge of the the corridor and the space in general, um, and it lets us align each of those floor tiles to the wall, which is important for a number of reasons. Um, not, not least of which is being able to spawn gameplay objects uh, on those tiles and have them back onto the wall instead of them facing the wrong way. But the same goes for props. Uh, before we started doing this, props could spawn in any direction on a tile, which is completely random. And that gave you the wonderful chance of being able to block a two-width uh, two two corridor. You could spawn props in there and actually block the player and the AIs, which was not a very useful thing to do. Um, but yeah, gameplay objects too. The genies that we have in the game need to be backed against a wall so that they're usable. Um, 
And even just down to, I think, the sand system that we've got in the game, this lets us align the sand props against the wall so it looks like a nice natural flow of sand coming off a wall. And then the next step is taking all those floor tiles that aren't on the perimeter and then collapsing them into larger pieces as well, which allows us to make more unique, uh, more, more unique pieces of level uh, uh, geometry that can then, again, help navigation. We can put bigger pieces in to reduce the the object count, and also then switch those out for gameplay objects or landmarks. But this is also a good opportunity, like the, the, the very large uh, red square on the left is a landmark, but it's also a massive visual blockage. So that creates interesting, uh, you know, an interesting visual for the player when they come out of that door. I mean, it's basically just a loop, but it, that kind of thing is an interest, is, it makes it more, the space more interesting. And then the last, the last system we put in to date is what we're calling special walls, but they're basically a wall that then knows that the tiles in front of me, I own them and don't spawn anything on the floor there. So we can have a interesting piece of arch architecture, whether it's a balcony or a, a thing that actually comes out into the space and we're not spawning objects. We're not having uh, the floors not spawning uh, like a, pile of barrels and pillars are going through and things like that. Or a trap in a, in yeah. a, in a non-useful non -useful place. But um, we also have uh, things called puzzle walls, which are literally just, th these are the handcrafted elements where we're spawning a, a little platforming puzzle which you have to climb up on the wall. And we use the special walls to be able to spawn in like uh, three width to six width, I think, ones of those. Puzzles, yeah. yeah. So, here is a video of a space that was created using all of these rules. Um, and you'll see uh, AJ's gone through and he starts selecting things and turning them on and off. You'll be able to see, uh, like for example here, I think this is a three width wall, so that's batched three wall pieces together. You can see the genie's been aligned to the wall, um, but it also has a trap in front of it because it knows that that's okay. This is a puzzle wall, which is one big piece. That's a platforming puzzle wall. Um, you can briefly see the, the sand up against the wall there too. Again, it's oriented correctly. We still have some one-by-one one pieces because we still need to be able to have the flexibility to fill in those little spaces. Um, what's this one? A five, five width. But you can see how much visual interest this has added compared to the original art space, for example. Uh, and in the background, I think you get another better look at it too, but you'll see one of the large sort of uh, door pieces. Um, oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about this one? Oh, yeah. We I tried to start spawning effect, cool sand effects and things in the game and then obviously uh, it was just clipping through everything and the player could get under there and it was, so having that, that uh, special wall system, which is, I mean it's a very basic thing but allowed us to create a lot more visual interest without breaking the idea of just having a very simple uh, procedural space with, with walls um, just spawned off the edges. This is one of those big doors where, you know, those, those things are really easy to spot from right across the map the player can just sort of subconsciously see them and go, well, there's a, there's a place I can go. Uh, it wasn't something that we could do before. Um, and also had to preserve the tiles on the floor so we could uh, not have, again, gameplay objects and props and things spawned inside them. Unless we want them to. Yeah. Having, having knowledge about those, those tiles is important. Yeah, again, this guy, he's a genie. He's a, basically a user interface or a uh, Bioshock Style it's a vending machine. vending machine. We're pretty much replicating yeah. the Bioshock vending machines. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, he, the player needed to, you know, one of our first play tests, people were like, oh, I can't use this thing because there's a pit in front of it. Um, so, you know, we just, there's all these little rules had to go on top of rules, on top of rules until, until the sort of the, the gameplay space became playable and navigatable. This is one of the spans that we're talking yep. about too. So the, we've detected off the corner here, it's detected a wall across from there. We can put a span there. Again, it starts to create like, uh, a, a slightly more unique view each time you're looking in first person, so the spaces start to feel like they're a different place, they're not just a whole bunch of boxes. Uh, and I guess there was a point where a bunch of these rules all uh, sort of coming together started to create like these unique looking um, corridors as opposed to just a, you know, just box cover. after box after box. Yeah. And, and one of the other um, sort of important aspects about this is that every time we developed a piece of knowledge about a tile, there was an opportunity for us to piggyback gameplay onto that as well as not just not just visual interest. Um, and with the spans in particular, it, it wasn't necessarily super obvious. But the game um, the game involves a whip, which we've tried to make as versatile as possible. It's actually the main player's tool. 
Um, you can whip enemies, you can whip objects, you can do all, the, but you can do a lot with it. One of the things you can also do is swing off swing points. And um, once we had the spans, that was a very logical place for us to start putting those swing points because it's right in the middle of the corridor, easy for the player to see and easy to reach. Um, yeah, we actually put the system in and they were like, there's nowhere to swing from. Yeah. But obviously the middle of a corridor is the perfect place where you just want to whip You're not going to bash into the side or anything yeah. like that. And that's one of the big landmarks, obviously, in the middle there. So, a little bit about getting gameplay. And we talked about proceduralness, we talked about believable, um, now we're talking about playability. Um, there, because we came to this a bit later, we did a lot of uh, AJ and, and the artist, well, AJ and the artist, I should say John Travis, because there's only two of them, um, did a lot of work very, very early on and kept that going to try and make the space look good. Um, but gameplay was coming on later because I was mostly focused on the player. Um, so there's a, a lot of tension between what the what I wanted the, the game space to do and you know the art, um, and so the order of things, the order in which things are spawned is a large complex list of uh, of, of priorities, um, but generally speaking, the gameplay objects started coming in first um, because it, you know if we want to have four genies must appear in this level, then we need to make sure that those genies are going to spawn, so we have to kick something else out of that tile. Um, we never really expected pure randomness to work, but I fully admit to, in my designer mind, going, maybe it will work, you know, like maybe you can just press a random button, everything will be awesome, and I... Uh, let's, just, let's just try random again, see. Yeah. Oh, if I press it again, it this time work. it'll work, this yeah, time it'll work. Next time, oh, next like time. Let's put this new either. thing in and just spawn them. Oh, no, yeah. it didn't work. So again. I was randomly, yeah. randomly abused for <laughs> having that idea, and, and it was quickly thrown out. Um, so instead, we really had to focus on the systems that we were going to have um, and allow for the interaction to come out systemically rather than um, randomly and certainly yeah. not handcrafted. I mean, this was a, a sort of a, a, a long sort of learning process for us on a journey that I guess other developers have already been on. They've made procedural games, but this was sort of a, how, our experience going through this process. Yeah, yeah. driven by necessity. But so here, just one of the examples we wanted to talk about, yep, um, is how we place the traps now. Uh, you know, I had my design goals for the traps, which is, they, as you see there, they needed to be an obstacle, sometimes a bit of a puzzle. They need to be an opportunity. There's a, a, by which I mean, this place is not just filled with traps, it's filled with creatures that are trying to kill you. Um, and whilst you're armed with a whip and that's your primary, primary tool, you do have a sword, but you're not the best combatant in the world. But these traps are an opportunity. You can, you can generally dispatch an enemy much faster if you can trick them into a trap or uh, use the whip to drag them into a trap or otherwise manipulate them into the trap. So I want players to be afraid of the traps but also always have them in mind of like where is the nearest trap and how can I use that in a situation. So they're always present, sometimes avoidable and hopefully sometimes an opportunity. Um, so going on to how we spawn them. <coughs> This was the pure random. Hey, let's just spawn X number of traps in this space. Um, so this is a really, really crappy diagram, but um, the idea here is there's a start room, which is where the black arrow is. On the right-hand side is the end room. Those two things are kind of pre uh, deterministic. They always get spawned roughly in the same place. And then Dungeon Architect fills in the, the gaps in between them. Um, and there's a couple of rooms scattered throughout this, but a, lo a lot of this is corridor. So the idea was, yeah, let's just spawn these, these traps. There's floor traps there and there's wall traps. The, the uh, orange things are basically a wall trap that has a, a field of effect that's two tiles deep. And we have ones which are longer and, and some wall traps which are only one tile deep. Um, and so it kind of shat these things out into the world and made a really crappy job of it. Um, nothing particularly interesting is going on there. And if the player walks through there, you can see that they, if they really wanted to, they could pretty much just walk around everything and not even engage with the traps. And there's no logic there for the player to understand either. Like there's no interest for the player to learn. And that's, these games have to be a lot about the player learning the rules of the system. So the first thing we want to do is let's try and put these, these wall traps into somewhere that actually means something. Um, so we, we do a detection on how wide is the corridor and how wide is this trap. And we have a roster of different width traps and the system now looks through looking for spots in corridors and how wide they are. And it, simply puts them in the player's way. This is not to say they're not avoidable still, like uh, an example would be we've got a sand blast trap which periodically blasts, you know, horrible damaging burning sand out, um, but it's on a timer, so you can always just wait and get through it. So that was a good start. More importantly, it was choke points. Um, you know, we know where the player's gonna go because we have doorways. We know that they're gonna be forced to travel through those doorways. We do have multi-branching paths 
So there are oops, multiple ways through any level, um, but you're still going to have to travel through doorways. So the meanest thing that we ever did was we said 100% of these doors are going to have a floor trap in front of them. They're never inside the room, they're only outside the room, so you can open a door and you know, blasely walk out and you'll cop a set of spikes up the jaxi. Um, we have since turned that down. It's not 100% of the time, but it was enough. It's enough to terrify people and that is, uh, it's kind of the flow of the game now is you have to get used to opening the door. Is it safe to step out? Yes, it is safe to step out. No, I have to deal with this trap. Which trap is it? Okay, how do I deal with that trap? Can I use it? There's a guy there. Let me pull him That's into That's true. The trap. Yeah, you yeah. do a lot of uh, making noise so the guy will come through and he cops the trap instead. Um, so we started to move some of those traps into those choke points here. It's Again, I didn't make the rooms blue on this diagram. I don't know why, but the, basically I've put traps in front of some of the doorways leading into the rooms. Um, the next thing we started doing was amalgamating some of these floor traps, uh, not just for the batching or performance reasons, but because larger traps are sometimes more interesting. They create some of those loops that we're talking about, uh, if not visually, but from a movement sense, from a traversal sense, a traversal sense sorry. Um, and they create those opportunities. Some of the larger traps are really good for drawing the enemies into them. Um, and so you've started, you see how we started with that just random mess um, and now we've put through these rules so far. Yeah. And it kind of created some new gameplay tactics. Like you could, if, there was, if this space here with the two orange traps had six enemies, if you wanted to, you could sort of run around and then kite them all into one big trap in the center and sort of feel like you know, you'd, you'd trick them all. So it created some nice, like just some new gameplay opportunities and strategies that just weren't there before when yep. there was just like these tiny little pockets of danger. And the rules, the player can now learn these rules. The, yeah. the player now knows, be careful at doors, the player now knows, watch out for two-width corridors, etc. These are things that they can grok and then and, and use going forward. And I think this is a putting it all together video. So this is, I, I guess this was taken last week. Yeah. So we're out on early access. This is pretty much what the spaces look like now. I guess this is the space you were walking around in before um, yeah. in, in the previous videos. You've got walls that come into the space. Um, we've got gameplay objects that are spawning in not just random places, but useful places. The barrel there, you could have whipped to hurt those guys. Is he going to? I, th I think I do and show our awesome yeah. ragdoll oh, physics. Watch the ragdoll yeah. freak out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're still working on that one. Um, you can see some of the traps are spawning in choke points. We've got the landmarks. You, could, you know, that creates an interesting vista down this corridor. There's a puzzle wall in the distance. Um, we're starting to spawn loot in logical places. We started out spawning loot just in the middle of floor tiles. Now they actually spawn in places where you might expect to actually find it. There's puzzle walls, there's spans for visual interest. All of this stuff is coming together. Suck that, dude. Um, there's our sand blasting trap, which is a very, creates a very nasty little pincer moment just there. Um, so yeah, this has all come together and here's the exit room uh, where you get to leave. So, in conclusion, Right. So we'd never done anything procedural before. Uh, so get ready to learn, I think, was, was our number one lesson. Like every, everything we knew about sort of building gameplay spaces had to be relearned. And uh, like then we had to sort of go, well, what, what have we done in the past? And then how can, how can we get Ryan to do it for us instead of uh, Ed and I doing it in the editor? Uh, so there was a lot of sort of translation of, well, normally I'd do this. And he'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to have to do it now. Um, so it was a very different way of working just between the team as well. Um, uh, we had to, I think setting those goals at the start uh, really helped us have some concrete places to go. So we were able to do um, most of this work fairly quickly, uh, which was, I think, because we had those goals and we're like, here's the, here's the eight things we want to do. Uh, and we, we sort of, we get one working and we test it. We'd iterate on it. Uh, and then I guess we'd actually, we tried to get each, each stage working before we moved on to the next, because um, I think Ryan worked on, I worked out very early that if he just started putting all these things in, tried to jam all these things in like very roughly in one go, da -da -da -da, the house of cards started to collapse. So he'd get all the wall stuff working properly and then we'd start point, um, supporting the gameplay assets off those. And then we started looking at, right, well, now we have to solve the ground. It's all broken. There's like things on top of each other. So we went and did that. Um, so we, yeah, we definitely a lot of iteration before we moved on to the next. We had to sort of hold ourselves back and go, hey, I want this, I want that. And he's like, I haven't got this working solidly yet. And I think... We're still saying that now. Right. But we ended up with a, a 
very sort of bug free system. Like there wasn't like once once we got something in, it it I sure. think that like going going through slowly helped. Yes, it is yeah, relative. Yeah, it's, going it's, pre it's pretty stable. That's yeah. true. Um, and you know, if you can buy something so you don't have to do it all yourself and then build on it. Yeah, ninety nine dollars. 99 bucks. Well, like, we had to buy six seats. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, six. Right. Oh, I can't even do I don't that. Know. 600 that in, bucks. Whatever. Translate that into man oh, hours. That's probably US dollars too. So whatever. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, that, that, the, the yeah. number of man months that saved us is ridiculous. Just yeah. ridiculous. And also, um, to speak specifically to the Dungeon Architect plugin, the guy who's making it is incredibly responsive. Yeah. Um, he's constantly making it better. I'm not saying everyone else is going to run out here and use it, but I, I, know, I think we got extremely lucky yeah. um, with that guy and that plugin. And yeah, that I think we mentioned it too. Just having that removing a bunch of decision making from your process because you've already gone with some kind of off the shelf thing. As long as it's close enough to what it is that you want to do, um, you're not going to have to bend over backwards too much to modify it. That was that was also. Um, I don't think you can discount how useful it was to not have to think about things. Yeah. And I think that's it. Thank you for listening, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs>puts all the tiles that are in one area into a, I guess, a group, and then you can query that group of tiles and ask where those tiles are in, com in comparison to, in relationship to a doorway or, or a stair or, or each other. Uh, we haven't really used it because we already branched off on our own, on our own journey. <laughs> But yeah, there's definitely a lot more features in there. Yeah. yeah, a point that Ryan wanted us to make actually was that by the time we ship, we're probably really there's not going to be much left of Dungeon Architect in what we're doing. We've modified it so much. But in the especially in the layout, in the level layout, yeah. um, you know, basically I think we'll be having we'll be doing our own spaces, but then using his system to Thing. spawn all the assets based on our rules. And uh, that was a that was just a you know a very big like time saver as having a system that could spawn all those actors and do a low, like a very small amount of randomization. There's percentages on the walls that can turn up and like that was already there. So we didn't have to worry about that. We were more focused on how do we get a first person playable space that uh, you can navigate in. So let us think about sort of the higher level, I think, which was good. Yes. Right, right. So I guess the question is, how do we how do we choose what to spawn in terms of traps and puzzle walls? Um, so part of the believability, I guess, is is making these spaces kind of consistent with themselves. There's there's twelve levels in the game, um, and it's in three level chunks: the streets, the gardens, the catacombs, and the palace. Um, so pretty early on, we decided that we needed you know like traps that appear in this level or this set shouldn't appear in another one. Um, so that's one way that we, we, we start like culling down what's going to appear. And the same holds true for enemies. Um, yeah, I think the first, yeah, the first playable thing, like build we sent out to, you know, sort of friends and other devs just had every single thing we had in the game in the first map. And people were just like, this is horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a, it was a, it was a mess visually and, and gameplay wise. Um, so it's more of a small subset. I guess, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think that's mostly it. Other than that, um, it's really about percentage chance of, of how many of them are going to appear. But we don't, like, um, like trying to give you a concrete example, the, the streets are mostly spike traps, the ones that spring up from underneath you, large spike traps, the big circular one, and the sandblasting walls. Um, it's mostly about finding opportunities to put them in rather than culling them out. Um, puzzle walls are the same. Uh, you know, we, we uh, are still not actually spawning enough of them. Um, because there's that tension between, you know, do you get a puzzle wall or a special wall or whatever? Um, I don't know if I answered your question particularly well. Um, yeah. That's a, yeah, okay. that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> we'll a take fit. that as a pass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, up the back.
I'll take this. Uh, if we were doing a basically like a submerged style SQL, would we use a bunch of this tech? Uh, or, or a similar process? Abs absolutely. We were talking about this the other day, actually. Yesterday. <laughs> like how do how do we how do we make a whole bunch of cool procedural buildings and ruins and things using like similar process? I think we definitely would. Yeah, um, hind hindsight's twenty twenty. But if we thought to do procedurally generated submerged, we would have. It would have been a hell of a lot easier. The, the puzzle walls in that are um, could easily have been procedurally generated more than me as a designer just sticking things together. Yeah. Sorry, you were first. Um, you were talking about at the start um, using having things deterministically generated from a seed, right? So you can go back and, and test things later on using the same seed. I was just wondering um, if you do anything to keep that deterministic when you add new features, because like a lot of the time with those sorts of systems, like if you add something in the middle of the process, everything from that point on will change. I um, think that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's impossible for us to hold on to it, unfortunately. Uh, and we, you know, we, we invalidate previous seeds every time we add anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, we still have the advantage, of, like it's what lets us do a daily challenge system. Everybody gets to use the same seed. But that, but yeah, you're right. There's no way to hold on to to the previous. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been great too with people going. Hey, there's this there's this broken dead end wall, and they can just take us hit the copy the seed button and post it in the forums. It actually copies the seed and their location now, so it's really useful for yeah. that. Ah, ha, ha, we don't save. There is no saving. It's a roguelite. If you die, you die. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, like, I mean, it's a bit shit, to be honest. Like, if you, you <laughs> in that you can't walk away. Like, you can't like play for twenty minutes and go. Sh you know, I've got to go do something and then come back. Um, we don't currently have any way of preserving your, your game state at all. Uh, but it's also a big task to try and bite off. Uh, we may come to that later on, but right now we're sort of reveling in the not having to worry about it. <laughs> um, what kind of design and hard decisions did you have to kind of compromise on or even cut because the procedural system just wouldn't work? Well, that's a, that's a, what, what did we have to cut art or design-wise? From... I wanted domes. <laughs> <laughs> And he wanted curved walls. I still want curved walls. Right. We're not done yet. Yeah. So, um, and and cool round towers and uh, you know I guess yeah there was a bunch of things that aren't in that art test video that I because I was trying to adhere to like I've got four by four tiles and just straight walls and yeah there was a lot of lot of sort of cool like cooler shapes and and things that I that I just had to okay I'll just delete that. Um, but, you know, we're thinking, hopefully we can spawn that stuff outside the playable space and still have it sort of in the vista and, again, create some more um, unique views for the players to sort of, you know, I, I think that's the way I'm thinking about the game now. It's more like as long as, like, 30% of the stuff on screen is, a, is arranged in a unique way, then people can sort of understand where they are and not get lost. And I think we're, we're getting there because a lot of... We were terrified when we released the game into early access and... Uh, and a lot of the, the uh, feedback was really positive that, hey, this doesn't look like total crap in terms of procedural generation, which is... We're not you know, fully... Like, we still yeah. know it does... You can see the tiles if you look hard enough, but I think yeah. we've done a reasonably good job of covering that up. Yeah. I don't think I've had to give up on anything particular in design, which is like an amazingly... Oh, we're done. Are we done? Are we done? Yeah. All right. So Another, we... Any other... What, last question? One last... Yeah. <laughs> It's still we're still tackling that one. So um, a lot of the a lot of the lighting's like um, comes off the more unique tiles because we know there's like if there's a four length wall or because uh, yeah one of the problems on console is like too many dynamic lights because there's no baked light uh, light maps or anything. Yeah, so we've, I've basically been moving the lighting into the more unique assets and there's just less of them in the space, and then that's like just dropping down the count. But it's not exactly a a, a very scientific method yet. <laughs> But that's probably a challenge we're going to have to get to. Um, probably having, like what we do with a lot of the loot and other, and other things is there's, there's points spawned and then the system goes through and just goes, well, I'll put six things on these 50 potential spaces and we'll probably have to do that with lights as well. So it's like concrete numbers. All right, I know we're out of time. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, guys. If, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to grab us at any time and there's our Twitter things.